Okay, welcome to video 19. Uh, I'm calling this one Oppositional Culture because it's based off a sort of an off-handed footnote, which I thought was really, it was really striking to me um, in chapter 14 that Desmond makes. Here, let's just take a look at this. So he says, in my experience, Disadvantaged neighborhoods were characterized not by the presence of an oppositional culture as much as the palpable lack of one. So one of the things that I asked in the exercise was to explain what he meant by palpable, uh, I'm sorry, by oppositional culture. And there's a common mistake that comes up here that I want to, I want to correct in what we're about to do. I also want to call your attention, though, to this other uh, quote. Um, so this is uh, Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward. And this is something that Desmond quotes in the same in, in the same passage, the same part of the book that was footnoted earlier. For a protest movement to arise out of these traumas of everyday life, um, in this case, the traumas are going to be things like eviction, right? Um, people have to perceive the deprivation and disorganization they experience both as wrong and as subject to redress. The social arrangements that are ordinarily perceived as just and immutable must come to seem both unjust and immutable. So when he talks about an oppositional culture, and the fact that there's a palpable lack of oppositional culture in, uh, for instance, the trailer park especially, um, he is talking about this kind of change in consciousness. So now, one thing that I've noticed what happens when I ask what does he mean by oppositional culture is um, people uh, just Google oppositional culture and uh, the, res the first result that you get typically is not the thing that he is talking about, that Desmond is talking about here. Also, if you were, if you are an education major, you're doing, um, uh, you going to school to be a teacher, you may have encountered the phrase oppositional culture in this other sense. That's not what he means. So uh, in education theory, the idea of oppositional culture came in as an explanation for the difference between educational achievement in blacks and whites. Um, uh, so uh, these, what I've got here are a bunch of quotes um, uh, uh, from previous student exercises where they, they're using the term oppositional culture in this way that it's used in, in education theory, right? So oppositional culture usually refers to caste theory or differences between black and white. A lot of these are kind of unclear, um, but actually what education people mean by oppositional culture is pretty straightforward. They, they are complaining or hypothesizing that black students aren't doing as well in their courses because doing well in school is perceived as acting white, right? Um, and all I want to do now is say that's not even what we're talking about. So oppositional culture in that sense was this phrase that educational theorists used um, to explain this alleged phenomenon of, of black students not wanting to act white. And um, whether or not that's true doesn't matter because that's not what we're talking about here. Um, so actually, if you just look at the Wikipedia entry for oppositional culture, um, you get uh, this remark here. So the first sentence uh, gives the education theory definition of oppositional culture. It says, Oppositional culture, also known as blocked opportunities framework or the caste theory of education, is a term most commonly used in the study of education to explain racial disparities in educational ach achievement, right? And so, uh, yeah, oppositional culture, that's also a blocked opportunities framework. The idea is, oh, these students have opportunities, but they're blocked somehow. But that's not what Desmond is talking about. Look at the, look at the second comment. However, this term 
um, the term refers to any subculture's rejection of conformity to the prevailing norm and values, not just within the educational system. And so that's coming a lot closer to what he's talking about. Um, it helps here to um, look at the context for the footnote that was originally given. So he says, so it's not education anymore. He's just talking about disadvantaged neighborhoods. And they're not characterized by the presence of an oppositional culture. What's going on here? Well, look at back at the original context. That footnote comes from this sentence here. Evictions help get rid of the riffraff, someone said. No one thought the poor more undeserving than the poor themselves. So again, this is, uh, let me give you more of this context. So what's happened here is that um, Scott and uh, Scott and Ned and Pam are all being evicted, um, and everyone basically says that it's their own fault because they're drug addicts. Um, so this is the full passage. Trailer park residents rarely raised a fuss about a neighbor's eviction, whether the person was a known drug addict or not. Evictions were deserved, understood to be the outcome of individual failure. Um, and then the part I read before, they helped get rid of the riffraff. No one thought the poor more undeserving than the poor themselves. So oppositional culture is this sense here that where the poor think that they are undeserving. Or if something bad happens to someone in the trailer park, everyone else in the trailer park thinks they have it coming, including eviction. An oppositional culture would be something where the people in the trailer park would think of themselves as opposed to this outside larger culture and therefore be more willing to resist um, what, what's going on. But that's not what... Um, what Desmond sees actually in any of the poor neighborhoods he visits. So in years past, renters opposed landlords and saw themselves as a class with shared interests and a unified purpose. During the early 20th century, tenants organized against evictions and unsanitary convictions and unsanitary conditions. When landlords raised rents too often or too steeply, tenants went so far as to stage rent strikes. So what he means by oppositional culture here actually might even be more, more basically thought of as class consciousness. Uh, in this case, the class is renters. Um, if people had a culture where they thought they were a unified group in opposition to a larger culture, there would be more resistance. And this is where the ideas from um, Piven come in. So let's take a look at this full passage. Petitions, picket lines, civil disobedience. This kind of mobilization requires a certain shift in vision. For protest movements to arise out of the trauma of daily life, sociologists Francis Fox Piven and Richard Clowen have observed, social arrangements that are ordinarily perceived as just and immutable must come to seem both unjust and immutable. So again, traumas of everyday life. This is the sort of thing that we were just talking about with the evictions in the trailer park of Pam and Ned and Scott. Um, and these are everyday events, and the people in the trailer park think of them as... Um, well, the phrase from Piven and um, Cloward is just and immutable. Immutable is kind of a weird word, but it just means changeable. So basically, people in the trailer park view the way things work as just. They view it as fair, right? Fair is another syn a synonym for justice here. Um, and unchangeable. That's just, look, this is just the way things work, and it's the way they should work. If you do drugs, you get evicted. That's just the way the world is. Um, a shift in vision occurs when people 
see the current situation as both unfair and changeable. Let me finish with this passage. This usually happened during extraordinary times when large-scale social transformations or economic disturbances, the post-war housing shortage, say, or perhaps even an epidemic, a pandemic, um, profoundly upset the status quo. But it is not simply enough to perceive injustice. Mass resistance was possible only when people believed they had the collective capacity to change things. For poor people, this required identifying with the oppressed and counting yourself among them, something trailer park residents were absolutely unwilling to do. Um, and he goes on to say, for most residents, Scott, among them, the goal of being in a trailer park was to leave, not to plant roots and change things. So he also talks about how an astonishing number of people in the trailer park describe themselves as just passing through, even though they've been there for 20 years. So when Desmond says something um, is missing, this is what he means. Um, this is the oppositional culture that he thinks is missing. Um, you need to see a group of people who perceive the current situation as unfair or unjust. And they see the current system as something that they can change. And they see themselves as a group unified by their common interest in changing things. That's the oppositional culture that Desmond is talking about. And he feels a palpable lack of it. Absolutely. Um, instead of seeing oppositional culture, he sees that no one believes the poor more undeserving than the poor themselves. So, uh, I'm, uh, I don't have any further conclusions to draw from this. Um, these are just the essentially direct observations that Desmond has made as a, a, a field observer and uh, other sociologists have made looking at broader trends.